Hi guys, in this video I'm going to give a brief technical overview of uh, Brabham's BT52. That was the car that Brabham used in Formula 1 in 1983. But the story of the BT52 started earlier, uh, basically in 1982, with the BT51. Initially, um, Brabham planned to race the BT-51 in 1983, which was a development of their work on the BT-50 in 1982. And basic parameters of, uh, of the BT-51 was that it was going to be the ultimate, ultimate ground effects car. I'm just going to ground effects car. So that means they had these massive side pods where air would go in and inside those side pods you had a sort of a wing profile all along the length of the car and that that wing profile or inverted wing profile produced a massive amount of downforce that was his first parameter for the bd51 the second parameter for the bd51 it was going to be a pit stop car so uh, in 1982 brabham uh, started a new strategy which was basically having uh, uh, pit stops in the middle of a race for refueling what they did they started the race with the cars uh, cars fuel tanks half full this uh, rendered the cars much faster than the rest so they built up a huge lead and then they would come in pit fuel up and come out still in the lead and thus finish the race. That was the theoretical uh, plan of it. Uh, unfortunately, in 1982, that was also the first year uh, Brabham started their partnership with BMW, and um, reliability issues. Uh, it, it was uh, due to reliability issues. The team was uh, not able to finish a lot of races. I mean, the strategy worked pretty well. They led the beginning of, the ra of, of a lot of races in 1982. And um, uh, they, they refueled and they went on leading. But then, you know, always something broke, either on the engine or the chassis. So the strategy was never really uh, fulfilled, if you wish, in 1982. So 1983, uh, Gordon Murray, then technical director of, uh, of Brabham, decided to build the BD-51 as a pit stop car, basically a car which is not able to finish race distance without refueling. But then in uh, October or November, sorry, November 1982, the rules changed and ground effects was banned. Yeah, ground effects was banned. And what basically the rules said that between now here here's a sketch of uh, of the BT51 here the, here are the wheels at the at the front and the back I didn't draw the wheels because they would be now in the way of that sketch, but basically up until 1982 you had uh, you had these side pods in them was an inverted wing and that produced downforce pushing the car downwards making it stick on the road and thus uh, making it faster through through turns for uh, from 1983 onwards this. Uh, inverted wing was banned and basically the underbody between so if I draw it from the side uh, ground effect cars look like that that's the profile oops let me just draw that better that's the profile of the side part okay an inverted wing and for 1983 the rules was that you're not allowed anymore uh, wing profiles you, you would have to have a flat flat bottom the only wing profiles are allowed after the rear wheel and in front of the front wheel okay but within that wheelbase you're, you're only allowed flat bottoms so basically this pt51 concept was thus obsolete and hence came the bd52 because then in 1983 what gordon murray decided they decided not to have a modified version of that BD51 basically have that same car but with a flat bottom but they decided to do a whole new car and that was the BD52 uh, a lot of other manufacturers like notably Renault did minor modifications to their car Brabham was the one 
which had the most radical concept of of them all and another radical concept i'm going to discuss at the end of the video was the mclaren so uh, looking at the bt52 the basic design parameters were first of all it's going to be a pit stop car so it had a small small a small fuel tank meaning that the car size could be reduced the car was not able to finish a whole race distance without refueling except at monaco and other other street races because at monaco you're not allowed to refuel in the pits because you know it was a it was middle in the middle of the of the city and it was pretty dangerous uh the second second parameter for the bd52 was it shifted a lot of weight to the back so at the front it had relatively less weight but at the back a lot of weight was uh, uh, was put at the back Third of all, it has minimal side pods. I mean, if you compare the BT51, you see here, that's the main, uh, uh, that's where the cockpit is here, the, the fuel tank and the engine. And here were the side pods. That was the BT51 and like in other cars as well. Whereas the BT52, you see within the wheelbase, you, we had nothing. You just had these delta shaped pods at the back, but the main, main, a lot of side pod area was reduced and that, the, the, the principle behind that was to reduce lift because if if you're not if you have got a, a lot of side pods and these side pods are not generating downforce because you now have a flat bottom instead of a, a wing under 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 under, under um, if, uh, instead of a wing uh, bottom of the side pod you're not generating downforce with these side pods and they are in fact they're generating lift they're trying to lift up the car in order to reduce that lift uh, Brabham decided to remove or to minimize those side pods to a minimum and, and thus that delta shape. And fourth uh, design parameter was they kept the car simple. For instance, the wing, the rear wing was a single piece. I'm going to discuss that later. They, they had at the rear, they had no anti-roll bar. For those people who don't know what an anti-roll bar is, it's a small bar. It's a small round bar which is uh, attached to the suspension. Let's say here's the right suspension and here's the left suspension. And when the car rolls, let's say in a turn, the car tends to roll, okay, like that. I mean, if it's turning now, the turn, it's turning, it's turning, uh, it's, it's, it, the car is moving in this direction and it's turning like that. And that twist in suspension, you see, that suspension is being compressed and that one is being elongated and to control the amount of roll you know allow of turn around uh, you know around that axis there's this bar which um controls that amount of roll the stiffer that bar is the less the car rolls with a smooth with a with a sorry with a soft bar the car would be like rolling a lot like this for instance okay and here's one wheel and here's the other wheel so that's a, sorry that that suspension would be very elongated i.e spring and that spring would be very compressed and if you have a hard bar the uh, anti-roll bar the car would roll less would be a flatter angle you know because it's it's always turning around this axis and here you would have the one wheel and here's the other wheel you'd have less elongation and here less compression obviously you'd also have less grip so it's always sort of a balance anyways they discarded that anti-roll bar at the rear they had uh, like i said a, a, a single piece rear wing so it wasn't adjustable it didn't have like most wings in formula one just let me roll down a bit here most wings in formula one if you look at them let's draw a simple wing So most uh, Formula One wings would be like that. They would have multiple flaps, and each flap here's the side plates, here are the side plates, and each flap would be adjustable on its own in order to maximize downforce. What Brabham did, they just did a single piece rear wing. So you know the, you you would have to replace the wing to get uh, more downforce or less downforce. All right. So these were the basic design parameters of the BD-52. Now let me get into detail about the technology behind the BD-52. And uh, I'm going to roll down here a bit. 
I'm going to start with the monocoque. This is now the lower section of the monocoque, and that is sort of the bathtub where the driver sits. Just let me improve that a bit. So that's like the that, that's the bathtub where the driver sits, the cockpit, and that's the fuel tank. That lower bit of the monocoque was made of aluminium, of a single sheet of aluminium actually, folded into a sort of this shape. And then added to that came the so-called scuttle, which is basically that part, the front part of the monocoque. Uh, let me just draw that here. So that scuttle was made of CFC. I'm just going to shade it. So that shaded bit was made of CFC, basically carbon fiber composites. So that was that was one part. The scuttle is the part of the cockpit or the monocoque where uh, 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 which surrounds the driver's legs. So the driver's sitting here. Here's the steering wheel, and his legs are basically under that scuttle. And that scuttle was in a BT52 made of uh, carbon fiber composites, where, uh, whereas uh, this part here is out of aluminium. And the top of the fuel tank, just gonna draw it like that, was also. Uh, out of carbon fiber. So these shaded areas were out of carbon fiber. The fuel tank, if I'm not mistaken, had a capacity of circa 190 liters, which uh, most other cars had like 240 or 250 liters at that time or 260. So basically, obviously, um, not enough to, to, to last the race distance. And that gave uh, the Brabham team the luxury this smaller fuel tank gave them the luxury to f uh, reduce the size of the car and, and, and uh, gave them more space to engineer the car the way they want it. Because a big fuel tank is always in the way, whereas a smaller fuel tank, well, it's less in the way. All right. Then that's the monocot. And then uh, you had the front suspension. The front suspension was nothing unusual, it was double wishbone push rod. What that means, looking at the front of the car, you had the front, the wheels, from looking at it from the front. You had a wishbone at the bottom, a wishbone at the top. A wishbone is that triangular piece. If I if I just draw a wheel 3D, that's the wheel. So the wishbone would be something like that. I'm just gonna uh, separate it from the wheel. It would be like a triangle at the top. And the same thing at the bottom. These two wishbone, these two wishbones in the wheel are connected by by a part called the upright. And here they're mounted to the chassis itself. And then that's where the BT52, the BT52 had a so-called double wishbone push rod suspension. Push rod means you had a rod coming from the bottom up this way attaching to the chassis and this push rod was basically every time the, the, the suspension was flexing was basically pushing on a spring damper assembly. So basically the push rod here in the 3D would go like this and then you would have some sort of, some sort of a rocker here and then you would have your spring and damper right here. This, this part here is all within the chassis. Right, so the BD52 had a uh, double wishbone push, push rod suspension. And uh, one characteristic of that car was it had here, because of that push rod, it had here, uh, you will see on pictures of the BD52, it had here two blisters, one here and one here, two blisters to house uh, that uh, rocker push rod assembly or la that rocker of that push rod to ha it, it didn't have enough space inside the bodywork so it got a small blister on the nose you would notice that any picture you see of the BD52 it had two blisters on the nose well these housed those rockers which actuated that push rod that the tires the tires were Michelin's and these were the better tires in 1983 and another thing about the car it had an air jack system. So basically every time the car pitted for a refueling and tire change, what it did 
they didn't use jacks to lift the car up, but the car had jacks mounted in it and they were pneumatic. So basically all you had to do is attach a pneumatic hose to the car with, you know, with, with high pressure air and the car with, has jacks so it lifts itself up. These jacks would just expand and lift the car up yeah, and you just attach uh, a hose of, of high pressure air and this high pressure air actuates the, the jacks and, and these expand and thus lift the car up and then the, the guys could change the tires and refuel the car at the same time. And by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, the pit stop strategy not only gave you a lighter car, which made your car faster and you could build a bigger lead in the race, but you could also, because you're not planning to run the whole distance, you could also run softer tires. Softer tires means stickier tires, which offer you more grip. So again, you're, you, you, you're expanding your advantage vis-a-vis -vis the others who have tires designed to last the whole race. Your tires and your fuel is only des designed to last for a fraction of the race. So you could afford less weight in terms of fuel. And because of your lower weight and because you're not planning to race the whole distance on those tires, you could also use softer tires. So again, you would have another advantage. So, and that was the plan behind the pit stop uh, strategy. And um, yeah, now we come to the engine. And the engine, I'm just gonna erase that bit here and mount the engine. And the engine was uh, a four cylinder, uh, 1500 cc, sorry, 1500 cc turbo by BMW. And it produced in uh, qualifying, it produced around 850 bhp. In racing, it produced around um, um, 600, 650 uh, bhp. And um, the, the, the difference was that f um, in the BT50, i.e. the predecessor of the BT52, the turbochargers were, the turbocharger, there was only one turbocharger, the turbocharger was placed to the right of the car and um, in the BD52, it was moved to the left of the car. So basically, the turbocharger was here. So uh, the turbocharger was on this side, basically here. You had like exhaust, exhaust pipes coming out and they were feeding that turbocharger. There was something like that. And the turbo turbocharger was on this side and you had you had two coolers. One, you had a big intercooler on this side, basically in a in a delta shape, basically like that. I'm obviously I'm drawing the parts not attached to the car to for us to see it better. So, oops, that's not. Let me let me just take the whole thing uh, way out here. So basically, the intercooler was on this side. The intercooler, what the function of the intercooler was, is to cool, because you see the turbocharger, what a turbocharger does, let me just explain a turbocharger quickly. What a turbocharger does, the engine exhausts, turn a certain turbine, and at the other end of that turbine is a compressor which draws in the air, compresses that air. Now that compressed air, as with any gas, if you compress it, it heats up, it heats up quite dramatically. And you cannot feed that hot air to the engine because you, it'll seize. So basically, before that air would be would, would be sucked in here through the airstream, it will get compressed. And before it gets sent to the engine, it has to be cooled down. And that's what the intercooler does. So what the turbocharger does, it, it passes that air to the intercooler. The intercooler cools that air and then passes it to the engine. And that intercooler was that big cooler on the left side of the car and on the right side of the car you will have two coolers or two uh, radiators the first one would be the I'm not getting that right so on this side you would have first a water cooler and then the oil cooler and these were the two uh, that that right part of that delta shape 
right and um, Unlike most engines, most engines in Formula One, most turbo engines in Formula One at that time were V engines, basically uh, V8s or V6. And most of them had two turbochargers, one on each side. But the BMW was an inline engine and it just had one turbocharger. And another thing about the BMW uh, inline, it could not handle most, most Formula One engines, most uh, or actually all V engines, in Formula One, V-shaped engines from one could handle chassis load. So basically, uh, a nor any any normal engine would basically just be attached to the rear of the monocoque, and it would act as that part of the chassis behind the monocoque. The inline uh, four engine of the of BMW could not handle any uh, chassis loads, so it was itself in a frame. It was itself mounted in a sort of a framework. I'm just gonna draw the sort of a, like a like a steel box, if you wish. And that steel box or framework was was attached via a steel plate to the back of the monocoque. And that steel framework or box handled all that all those chassis loads coming from the rear tires and and and, and being transmitted to the monocoque itself. Okay, so so uh, with with that inline engine. It could not handle those chassis loads on its own. It needed a sort of a framework around it and a thick a steel plate which attaches that thick steel plate is over here. And that steel plate attaches then to the rear of the monocoque. Now, one nice thing about the BT-52 was that this whole framework, uh, the, the coolers were also attached to this framework and all the fluid systems of the coolers as well so basically, it was very easy on the BD52 to have an uh, to have a rapid engine change, because the whole the whole framework with coolers could e could be easily removed from the car from Monaco, and then you know you, you just attach a new motor uh, plus uh, cooling system and so on to the car without any problems and in very fast uh, in a very fast method. And another thing is with the suspension up front here. They also had the suspension system up front here was actually not attached directly to the monocoque but if i'm going to zoom it up here uh, if let's say the front section of the monocoque is like that what brabham had they had i'm going to do it in a simple form that was the front of the monocoque and attached to that was a sort of a magnesium casting And that magnesium casting ha ha had all the suspension components in it, springs, dampers, uh, attachment points on. And that, that magnesium uh, casting was attached to the monocoque. So basically, if they wanted to change the front suspension, all they had to do was not, they didn't have to, dis to disassemble you know, each single suspension component like spring, upper wishbone, etc. They just disassembled that magnesium casting of the monocoque and just replaced it as one complete module. Again, in the in the interest of speed and simplicity. Right. Now we've got the uh, the the engine. Now we go backwards a bit and we come to the transmission. Here we have the transmission of the BT51. It was a slim, a slim. Uh, uh, transmission. It was designed by Brabham. Very slim because it was designed for the ground effects cars back then and the ground effect cars demanded a slim body because the slimmer your body is the wider you can have your side pods i.e. more aerodynamic area to generate downforce back then. And th because the gearbox is pretty takes a long time to develop that's one part I kept from the BD51. And that uh, transmission was designed by Brabham and had Hewland internals. Uh, basically, the gears and so on were, were uh, by Hewland. The, the, the rest of the, uh, the outside of the, trans, uh, of the transmission was by Brabham. Uh, it was smooth on the outside and webbed because, you know, you web those uh, web means like this. If you've got like webbed is basically if you have something like that and you'd have a, a sort of a, sort of some metal in that corner to give it more strength but that webbing wasn't on the outside of this gearbox but on the inside so the gearbox was strong 
but the webbing wasn't causing any aerodynamic drag because they kept the, the surface of that gearbox on the outside uh, very smooth. And that gearbox was pretty on the limit with reliability. And uh, they had then Peter Weissman uh, strengthen that gearbox and add, thus add more rel reliability to that. And uh, the cooling, if, you, if you're talking about engine cooling, the, the air, the airstream used to go like that, hit those pods and then exit at the back of the car. Same thing here, it would come like this and exit at the back of the car. And um, then here at the back, was there, let me just erase some, some parts here. So basically then you had that wing at the back here this and like I mentioned before that was a single piece it was um, made of multiple layers of carbon fiber and honeycomb and then those end plates were then attached to the single piece wing here's one end plate here's a second end plate and the wings on the BD 52 both front and rear are way bigger than those seen on earlier cars on those ground effect cars because here because you don't have those that ground effect anymore uh you need th those wings were basically your main uh generators of downforce and uh, like i mentioned before that cooling air was coming here hitting that delta shape and then exhausting through uh, to the back of the car so basically all that uh, cooling air exhaust was going right here under that wing and here's the, I'm not going to draw them, but here are the tires, rear tires. Here's one, here would be the second one, and here are the front tires. Right, and then you'd have, on top of all that mechanical package and monocoque, you would have then the, the, the bodywork itself. And the bodywork is basically that thin, I think it was uh, glass fiber, thin, thin uh, uh, bodywork, which had all the sponsorship on it and so on. And that bodywork actually had those blisters I talked about earlier. Right. Now, I'm um, just going to go through a few of the key races. Uh, the first race in Brazil was very hot. And um, in that race, what, uh, what happened is that um, uh, those coolers, uh, oil, oil and water, were, were the, the, the air, I mean, they were the, the exhaust air, exhausting out of those coolers, was actually overheating those suspension components here and uh, causing some problems to the suspension components like the spring and the dampers were getting over over hot because of that uh, 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 air coming from those coolers was pretty hot and was overheating those components so basically here what they had to do in brazil add some extra ducting to the bodywork up here because i'm just let me ju let me just take a different color and uh, the bodywork was of that car was basically like this yeah and they added some ducting on top for the air to exhaust and to divert the air from those rear suspension components as they were overheating that was one problem and uh, w w in, in brazil the initial problem but apart from that the car ran perfectly pk won that race in long beach the second race uh Brabham had a massive problem of getting their tires up to working temperature and they did very badly there. Going to Imola, which is basically the San Marino Grand Prix, that was the third race, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, both drivers, well, their performance wasn't that great. Uh, Patrese, PK's, PK's teammate, uh, led that race. And he, was, he nearly won the race, but he then got on those so-called marbles. Marbles, let me just revert the color back to blue. Uh, in any, in any uh, let's say you have a, a turn at a circuit. And cars take that ideal line like this. Oops, sorry. That's not an ideal line. That is. 
we take like an ideal line like this and outside that ideal line you would have here so-called marbles which is basically rubber pieces falling off the tires from all those cars and if you if you decide oh you know i'm gonna take this here you're you're not gonna have any grip at all and you, actually you're gonna slide that's why it's called marbles and that's what patrese did he i don't know for what reason uh, came off the racing line got onto his marbles spun and lost his lead and you know lost the race with pk he stalled his engine at the at the, at the beginning of the race got himself up to fifth place but then retired with a broken engine valve and uh, the next key race was detroit and there pk won that race and then the next key race was silverstone in uh, it was basically the british uh, grand prix and there the bt 52 b version came and what it had it had lighter bulkheads 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 are those the like um when you have a structure like a monocoque uh, let me yeah, i'm gonna put red again in any structure you have like like a monocoque you have multiple bulkheads these bulkheads give the monocoque strength and those bulkheads were initially made of aluminium single piece aluminium and uh, in the b version these were lighter lightened up i don't know i i think they were also made partially of carbon fiber but i can't i can't i can't i'm not 100 percent sure on that however also the inner part of that bathtub was also made in carbon fiber to reduce weight and uh, in the b version as well those blisters were reduced they were flattened out they were not more they're not they were not protruding anymore out of the bodywork as as in the a version the b version also had a shorter nose slightly shorter nose you wouldn't probably notice it and the underbody which is basically behind if you have the rear wheels or here let's say this is one rear wheel and like i mentioned before behind the rear wheel you could have an underbody producing downforce like a sort of an inverted wing and that underbody was also revised to produce more downforce and in the in uh, uh, from Zandvoort the next race uh, not the next race but the next key race uh, the Zandvoort uh, what BMW had they had a they had a boost control valve uh, produced by Brian Hart one of their Formula One competitors but this 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 uh, boost control valve would just basically control the amount of boost you're giving to the engine most drivers had a sort of a knob in in the cockpit where, which they turned for more boost and obviously less more power but obviously you know endangering your reliability and and less boost which g gave you better reliability and obviously less power so basically in, during practice uh, boost levels were very high because you didn't care if your engine blew you just needed for one lap whereas in the race um, you basically ran a lower boost uh, because you wanted to last or you wanted the engine to last the race distance and this boost control system was provided by Brian Hart and this improved the engine's performance at lower speed ranges and another thing what they had uh, in, in, ahead of this intercooler they had the system spraying water uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the intercooler to cool uh, to further cool the air before it goes into the engine because uh, it seems that the intercooler wasn't cooling that uh, air enough and uh, one, th one problem they also had, you know, since the very beginning, which was basically uh, their turbocharger, their turbocharger you know, has bearings in it. And those bearings were running very hot once the car was stationary. So if there's no airstream coming in, you know, like if the car is stationary, those bearings, the, turbo ch the turbocharger was still turning because the engine was on. And those bearings were getting really overheated. And that was a big problem with the car in the early stages of the season. So what they did, I mentioned that the car had an air jack system where you just, uh, you know, uh, attach a hose to it and the car lifts up. And what they did, uh, they, they diverted some of that air from that air jack system to cool those bearings on the turbocharger. So basically the, the air jack system, once, you, once the car is in the, in the, in the pit, you, you attach a hose to it with with uh, with high pressure air that high pressure air lifts up the car and gets driven 
over that uh, uh, over that turbocharger, thus cooling it, thus cooling the bearings, and that problem was then solved. I think they solved it by the second or third race. I'm not so sure, but they solved it pretty early uh, in the season. Right, and in Zandvoort was uh, was was that race was quite uh, notorious because uh, Prost was trying to pass PK from the inside. Uh, I mean, uh, say let's, let me do a, just a turn. I think it was the Tarzan turn in Zandvoort. PK was here and Prost was trying to go in here, uh, slid and pushed both of them out. PK retired immediately. Prost went on, but uh, but. Uh, uh, but but the retired after after some laps due to handing problems. I think one of his wings was broken or something. And um, the next race was Monza. PK dominated that. And then in Brands Hatch, something new appeared. Brands Hatch uh, was not a second British GP, but it was so-called European uh, Grand Prix. And Brands Hatch, something new appeared. Basically, those winglets, which is basically they 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 were Ferrari introduced them. And basically, the wings had like small winglets attached to them. And those winglets were a feature from that race, Branch at 1983, throughout the next season, 1984. They got banned in 1985, so you won't see them anymore in, uh, from 1985 onwards. But, but they were in 1983, at the end of 1983, Brabham introduced them in... in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, Brands Hatch after because uh, co just co copying Ferrari because Ferrari had them early on in the season, and then every single manufacturer used them in uh, 1984. Kialami again, uh, sorry, Brands Hatch again was uh, was Piquet's uh, race. He dominated it and won it. And then we come to the final race, which is Kialami. In Kialami, um, uh, the South African Grand Prix. Uh, Brabham did a, a different maneuver, basically a different pit stop strategy. What they did, they decided to have an early uh, pit stop strategy. So thus giving uh, Nelson Piquet less, even less fuel. Because you see, um, normally uh, Brabham throughout the season had their pit stop relatively late in the race. So the Usually the pit stops of the Brabham pit stops were usually uh, after the, the midpoint of the race. And in Kialami they tried to do something different. They they decided to have the pit stop very early in the race. So Piquet had very little fuel in his car and he stormed off in the early stages. He was like nearly two second two seconds a lap faster than everybody else. The 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 point of it was to shock everybody with his speed and to push his competitors to break their cars whereas he he wasn't pushing his car his car was just light because he had so little fuel in it and then he pitted early maintained his lead got out and his only contender then was Alain Prost and Alain Prost retired and PK could could take it easy after that and he just uh, he just allowed his teammate to take the lead uh, Ricardo Patrese so Ricardo Patrese won that race and even uh, Piquet even allowed Andrea de Cesaris uh, in an Alfa Romeo to, to get second place because uh, for th sorry third place was more than enough for Piquet and thus won the championship in 1983. All right, that's not a BD2. Now let me let me just uh, let me just discuss the issue of the the, the concept of the BD52 because there uh, I'm just going to revert to blue again. In 1983, you had basically, looking at the top of each car, you had basically two concepts, two radical concepts. First of all, you had the BT-52, which is basically, there is now the cockpit, fuel tank, and you had those Delta uh, coolers here, and you had here is rear wheels. I'm just going to draw it in simplified form, obviously. There's that shape. That was the BT-52. And then you had another concept, just gonna do the, uh, the wheels. Then again, mono, uh, cockpit, fuel tank. And here, here that's the McLaren MP4 slash 1C. And here they had no, very normal pods, but then these pods tapered at the back. 
the so-called Coke bottle rear end. That concept was introduced. You see those side pods until now in 2015. You still see them. And that concept was introduced by John Barnard of McLaren on the MP4-1C. And if you look at it, it's basically that concept is exactly the opposite of that. Here, you have no side pods and a delta shape. And here, you have side pods. And basically, you start wide and end up narrow at the back. The idea behind it was that that, that taper, that Coke bottle rear end, uh, basically cleaned up the air for the rear wing, okay, and gave you better cooling because the cooling was going uh, initially at the top, on top of the of the side pods, and then later on from 1985 was going to the side. Whereas with the with the Delta wing, with the Delta sorry not wing, with the Delta car with the BT52, the 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 cooling air was going through the back of the car, then out there. Now. Um, from 1984 onwards, nobody copied the BT-52. Actually, everybody used this concept. Even Brabham, the BT-53, the, the successor of the BT-52, used this concept, the Coke bottle concept. That delta shape was never used by anyone after 1983. It was just used by Brabham on the BT-52 and after that by no one else. So here, again, I would say it was a great concept back in 83, but... Remember that in 1983, both Williams and McLaren had no turbo engines. So there was no competition from them. And the only competitors to Brabham were Ferrari and Renault. And I think with Renault, their problem was I think more of a management problem. I mean, they weren't 100% behind Prost. I think if they were 100% behind Prost, Prost would have won the championship. And with Ferrari, I think, again, management problem. And I think here, they had no star driver. Because, you see, one big advantage of Brabham was that they could concentrate 100% on Nelson Piquet. The second driver played absolutely no role in that team. And I think that won them the championship more than the concept of the BD-52 because in my opinion and like the statistics prove that that concept wasn't a very strong concept because nobody emulated that car after 1983 actually everybody emulated the McLaren MP4-1 even Brabham 